So to finish the problem, what we're going to do is make an ice table with that same reaction. So it's still acetic acid. And of course, our initial amounts are 0 0.50 moles of each, the parent and the conjugate. Then it says we added 10 milliliters of 12 molar HCl. So in order to figure out how much of uh, these are going to react, we have to figure out how many moles that is. All right, and so however you want to do that, but this is a dimensional analysis is probably the most effective way. People don't mess that up as much once you get used to it. So we get 0.12 moles of HCl added. And just like in lab, we need to figure out what that's going to react with in the reaction. Because, of course, HCl itself isn't part of this equilibrium. So HCl can react as H plus or Cl minus. And so H plus is directly in this equilibrium. And so if I'm adding that many moles of H plus, right? The question is, what is it going to do? Well, it's going to cause the reaction to shift to the left by reacting with the acetate, right? So H plus and acetate are going to come together. So if we're reacting with the acetate, we're decreasing the acetate. And I circled this because this is not at equilibrium. This is the change we caused. Okay, so I'm trying to keep that clear to you. All right, so if we're, we react to this much acetate, we are going to produce an equal amount of acetic. So at equilibrium, it's just 0.5 plus 0.12 moles. And over here, it's 0.5 minus 0.12. And then we're just going to plug it right back into that henderson hasselbeck equation. The pKa is the same. And the main source of mistakes here is um, not putting the acetate on the top. So you want to make sure that the conjugate's always on top. So now that logarithm is not going to be the log of 1. So we actually do want to put it in the calculator. Um, make sure you're using parentheses around this whole thing or that you solve this first and then do the log. Okay, so we end up with, now, before, we, before I give you the answer, hopefully you've already tried this and you already know, but I want to think about this. If the reaction is shifting to the left because we have too much hydrogen ion, then what's going to happen, right? So we're going to consume this hydrogen and it's going to shift to the left and make some um, acetic acid. What do you think is going to happen to the pH? Is it going to go up or down? So the uh, answer is in this sign, right? And we added acid, so it should go down a little bit because this is a buffer, but um, not a dramatic shift, right? If we had put that many moles of HCl into our liter of water without a buffer, it would be, let's see, The pH would be 0.92, right? So that's the magic of a buffer. It makes a big difference. Okay, so now what if we put base in? So same exact reaction at this point. And so the question is, what happens if we put that much base in? It's still the same number of moles. I'm not going to recalculate it. But instead of being an acid, it's a base. You should be writing this equilibrium just as often as I am. It should be stuck in your brain because it is the primary example. Everybody uses this. So um, it's a good policy to, to write it many times so you remember it. And you should also remember the names. All right, so if we're adding that many moles of hydroxide, um, it's going to react over here 
Again, concentration wise, this is very low. Uh, we figured out it's 1.8 times 10 to the negative five. So it's very small. Whereas this acid is actually quite big. So we're going to go minus 0.12 and plus 0.12 because we're forming that if we're reacting here, okay? This H goes with this OH minus. So you're gonna form some more acetate. All right. So the numbers are the same, but we have flipped the ratio. So pKa is the same. Our acetate is now 60, uh, 0.62, and our acetic is 0.38. And so um, that log is definitely not 1 this time. We have 0.213, let's say. So that's going to remain positive. OK, so we put in a little bit of hydroxide. And so we do expect the pH to go up by a little bit. So that makes sense. So I made a nice summary table so we can look at what would happen. All right. And so if we hey, come back summary table. There you are. If if we had water initially, we have a pH of seven and then we add HCl and it goes down to 0.93. You should be able to do that calculation on your own, right? It's just a negative log of H plus concentration, right? Water, initially again, seven, and we add NaOH, it would actually go up to 13.1, so really high. When we have the buffer in place, these changes are really small, right? That's the magic of buffer. You react with the strong acid or strong base you're putting in, and um, the only H plus change happens from the shift in the equilibrium instead of the stuff you added in. So um, buffers are really common, especially in biology. You can't keep anything alive without having a buffered pH. And so common, in fact, I worked in a largely biology-based lab in grad school. People used to pay me in the form of lunch um, to, to make their buffers because as a chemist, I became pretty comfortable with it in grad school uh, or before grad school. So by the time we get to grad school, um, the biology majors were desperate to be able to keep their stuff alive. And um, so this is a this is a life skill that might feed you later on. <laughs> Part of understanding buffers is understanding they do have limitations. Um, Essentially, there's two, two limitations. The capacity, so in other words, how much, um, how much acid do you have present or base do you have present in your buffer that can react with the strong acid or strong base that you're putting into it? So that's basically the concentration of the buffer. The more concentrated, the bigger the capacity. So that makes sense. So you just have more moles, all right? So you have to know the concentration in order to know how much um, buffering capacity you have. The other thing to think about is the range. All right, so buffers work best when you choose a buffer that will have a range within plus or minus one of the pKa. So in other words, for, for our acetic acid buffer system, the pKa is 4.74, which means that acet acetate acetic acid is good if I want to keep something alive between the range of 3.74 and 5.74. So I went this minus one and this plus one. That's your buffering range. So a lot of the reason that many textbooks list pKa instead of Ka is because it makes it easier to find a buffer. You can just scan down the list and find one in the range you want, check and make sure it doesn't, it's not toxic to whatever creature you're trying to keep alive. And then you can just make that buffer. So going back to our prior example where we had a 0.5 molar buffer, we know that the answer here, oh, not the final, no, oh, sorry, it's 4.53. Ignore this. 
I want you to calculate using the same method I just showed you what the pH is going to be if I used a lower concentration of buffer. Okay, so instead of 0.5 in your initial, it would be 0.13. So do that and, and figure out what this pH is, and that's going to be in our learning check. Okay, so then after you have done that calculation, you can then answer this question down here. Is that an adequate buffer? And the way to answer it is, is again, if it's between 3.74 and 5.74, then you have not exceeded the buffer capacity. You have not exceeded the range. Um, well, so if it is between here, you have not, you have not exceeded the range requirement. If it's below this, you have. And so the reason that's bad is because the pH starts to change much more rapidly beyond this window. So you're going to exceed the capacity of the buffer very soon if you're outside of this window. So they are related to each other. Um, so quick summary of buffers. Okay, and you should have this in your mind. Um, if you have an acid buffer like we've been talking about and you add a strong acid to it, it's going to react with the conjugate. So you're going to decrease the amount of conjugate and you're going to form more of the parent. If I have a base buffer and I add a strong acid to it, it's going to react with the base, the parent base. Okay, um, so of course that's going to decrease and the conjugate is going to increase. If I add a strong base to an acidic buffer, it's going to react with the parent acid. Don't be tempted to react it with the, the H plus in your equilibrium, right? So it's going to react with the parent acid and you're going to form more of your conjugate. If I add a strong base into a, a basic buffer system, it's going to react with the conjugate and form more of the parent. Okay, so that's the basic idea there. So I just said I got paid in grad school, usually in the form of food, sometimes money. Um, to make people buffer. And one of the most common buffers is phosphate buffer because most organisms in the world need phosphate to survive. So um, there's some nomenclature, there's some naming stuff that happens, okay? So when we say a 0.01 molar phosphate buffer, so phosphate actually has three different conjugates, right? So if we, if we go look at appendix D, you're going to see that there's there's three different Ka's, right? And so the first one is when you lose the first proton. And I can't emphasize this enough. A lot of people are trying to skip this. You really need to write these out in order to understand which Ka's to use. So you guys keep choosing the wrong Ka in your worksheets. So the second Ka is when you take H2PO4 and you take off one of those H's. That leaves us with a two minus charge. And then our last Ka is when you lose that last proton. Okay, so the conjugate pairs for the Ka3 are HPO4 and PO4 3 minus. The conjugate pairs for Ka2 are H2PO4 and HPO4 2 minus, all right, and so on and on like that. So when we say that something is a 0.01 molar phosphate buffer, that means that all of the different conjugates in the solution add up to that concentration, okay? So you're going to have at least two, usually, uh, usually just two. The third one is there, but we usually don't care too much about it. It's very, very small. It doesn't affect the pH a whole lot. Um, so usually we're going to think about two conjugates are going to be in there, and you have to add those together to get the final concentration you're looking for. All right, so we're given a pH. I see that and I, and I see the word buffer. And those two things immediately make me wanna use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Could I do an ice table and then a Ka and figure it all out from there? Sure, absolutely I could. You'll still get the same answer. It'll just take you longer, okay? Um, so 
we have two stock solutions. We have a KH2PO4 and a K2HPO4. So that means if I ignore the K, because again, these are counter ions, that means that the actual equilibrium I'm trying to study is between H2PO4 and HPO4. So that happens right here. So that, that's what I mean when I say that the uh, Ka values from your textbook are only significant if you can figure out which K to use. And so writing these equilibriums out one step at a time really, really helps with that. The other thing to pay attention to is if you have a group one ion in front of your conjugate, just ignore it. It doesn't do anything. Group one never does anything. <laughs> just hang out, make everything dissolve. Okay. So we're given the pKa of our material, so I don't even need to look that up, but there's every possibility when you get to your homework that you won't know this and you have to go figure out which K to use. So the next slide just gives us a little space to work. The prior slide has, you know, like step-by-step -step directions, okay? All right, so we have these two facts. I'm just gonna erase the equilibriums I don't need. Okay, so it says phosphate buffer of pH 7.6. So in the henderson hasselbach equation, that's my final pH and my pKa is 7.2. And then I want to find the logarithm of the conjugate base divided by the conjugate acid. This is another place, putting these in the right position. It's very helpful if you have this equation written out properly. Otherwise, people are gonna flip it around, all right? So you always wanna put the conjugate base on top and the, con the conjugate acid on the bottom. Now, we don't know how much we have to put in yet. We know how much our stock concentrations are, but we're gonna dilute that. That's way too, too concentrated to make 0.01 molar, right? So when we dilute it, we wanna have this right ratio so that you end up with a pH of 7.6. Oh. So what we really need from this is the molar ratio. Okay, the chi actually is what we called that before. So first I have to go 7.6 minus 2, uh, 7.2. We get 0.4 from that. And that's going to be equal to that logarithm of the ratio. That's not an x actually, that's, you know, a chi from like Greek. This is base 10, so I'm gonna go 10 raised to this power to get X. There's no negatives. I said to get X, that's funny, because I just said it's not X. <laughs> so you get 2.5 there. So our ratio between our two different phosphate species is 2.5. That tells me I'm gonna need way more HPO4 then I do H2PO4, right? If you want to think about this in terms of moles or molarity, it doesn't matter. You get to the same place, right? So that's our ratio. The other piece I need, so this is two variables. I don't know, I don't know anything about either one of them in our actual solution. So the other thing I'm going to need is a second equation, which comes from this statement. All of the conjugates are going to add up. So the number of moles of HPO4, two minus, equals, oh, no, not equals, plus the moles of H2PO4 equals 0 0.01. That is in molarity, okay? So I can rearrange this and it doesn't matter which way you go, but I'll just go HPO4 two minus equals 0 0.01 minus H2PO4. So I just subtracted the H2PO4. Now I can go back to this equation. So 2.5 is equal to, we just defined HPO4 in terms of H2PO4. So the top here is gonna be 0 0.01 minus H2PO4 
Two minus. Too many brackets. Okay. Divided by the concentration of H2PO4. So now we have one variable, which is good. Um, some algebra happens. I, I, I hope you're pretty comfortable with algebra, but if not, there is a nice review in the back of your textbook, Appendix A, I believe. Okay, so all I did there was just multiply both sides to get rid of the denominator. Um, and then I'm also going to add H2PO4 to both sides. I'm running out of space here. Um, Um, so now I can distribute out that H2PO4 and we end up with something that's easier to solve. I'm going to clear some space, but I hope you have more space in your notes. Okay, there we go. So we're going to distribute out that. And so, well, actually I'll do it the other way. Don't forget what's on the right hand side. A lot of the time people will just sort of let it drop off. You don't want to do that. Okay, so now this is 3.5. Now we can just divide and we find out that H2PO4 minus one equals 0 0.01 divided by 3.5, which is 0 0.00288. Six. Now, sometimes people see that and they get all freaked out and they're like, oh my God, it's so small. But remember, our concentration is very small to begin with. All right. And so then to find out how much um, HPO4 2 minus there is, we'll take our total and subtract what we just calculated. And we find out that we need to put in 0 0.007 molarity. I'll keep a few more, 714 of the, so this one's H2PO4, and this will be HPO4 two minus. So the last step is to use your dilution equation and the stock concentrations that you have, all right? And so um, our final volume is 100 mils. And so we'll just do the concentration of KH2PO4, so 0 0.1 molar is initial, V1 or M1. I don't know what the volume is that I need of that, but I know that I need, so KH2 is going to be this one. So my final concentration will be there, and my final volume is 100 milliliters, right? So for this one, just to keep it clear which is which, we're going to need to add. So when people use this equation, they frequently put the 100 on the wrong side. Pay attention to what, that's why I label it first before I plug it into the equation. Pay attention to what is final versus what you're starting off with. Um, so anyway, we end up with 2.86 milliliters there. And it's milliliters because my unit of milliliters is going to match there of KH2PO4. The other one, of course, um, I'm going to do this in purple. The other one is a different concentration, but everything else will be the same. So 0.25 of K2. I still don't know the volume I'm starting with of that material, uh, but I do know that I want it to be 714 molarity and 100 mils. All right, so we get 2.86.
At this point, some people would be freaking out because those happen to match. That's not a coincidence. I would have questioned that way just because not a good reason for it. It's just that way. So what we would actually be adding into our volumetric flask before we dilute with water is 2.86 milliliters of each stock solution. And then we would dilute it up to 100 mils and mix it up. And then we would test the pH and we would adjust it with tiny drops of acid and base because it's never perfect, right? So this is a good ballpark figure and then you've got to adjust it to get exactly 7.60. And that's how you make a buffer.